Hello everyone and welcome to video number 18. Today we're just going to have a brief recap about the legend of Faust, so getting more information on exactly what we're going to be reading in Goethe's version, as well as learning more about how we classify Faust and then some techniques to better understand as we read. Before we dive in then to the literary analysis techniques we're going to be utilizing today, I want to give a brief recap about the Faust legend that I discussed last time, because understanding the basis for this folklore is going to help us better relate to the text and be able to understand it, particularly when the language becomes a little bit tricky. So just as we discussed last time, the Faust legend is based on a real life figure, Johann George Faust, and he was a German astrologer and magician. And he was able to produce such amazing feats that people were astounded by them. One of the things that he is famous for doing is producing wine out of thin air. So obviously, if he is very good at magic and he was living any time during the Middle Ages, the Renaissance and onward, he then would have been considered to have been making a deal with the devil. So people back then would have understood magic as something really supernatural, not really this sleight of hand. And so the conclusion was that he had all of this knowledge of magic because he had sold his, devil, sold his soul to the devil in exchange for that. And so a majority of the time we see the Faust legend, he is seen, right, Faust is, as this figure who is merely a sinner who is worthy and deserving of the damnation that he receives at the end of the play. However, it's very interesting when we come to Goethe's treatment of Faust because he treats him as a very sympathetic character, so someone that we should feel for. And this in large part is due to the fact that Goethe treats Faust as a romantic hero, this tormented intellectual soul who is simply seeking to gain more knowledge. And so rather than Goethe's play ending with the damnation of Faust, as so many others before him have, Goethe is going to end his discussion of Faust with the main character's salvation. Another thing we need to really get straight here then is how do we classify Faust? From the very beginning of the year, we've been looking at a wide variety of genres of literature. And Faust is really interesting because Goethe doesn't really write in one specific genre. And so it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what Faust is. So for example, there are elements of drama that exist in Faust, and oftentimes Goethe's Faust is referred to as a play, right? There's dialogue that takes place between characters. You even have stage directions. But Goethe uses so much dialogue and so many different stage directions and scene changes that really putting on a production of Faust is very difficult. So it's not often done. So we really can't exactly say that it's a drama. And another reason why we can't really say that is because it also has these elements of an epic, meaning an epic poem. So it's this long narrative poem with this greatly elevated style. But again, we have the issue of dialogue. So it's not that it's presented, for example, as Dante's Inferno in that epic poem where we really didn't have stage directions and, and dialogue situated as we're going to see in Faust. But then ultimately, we need to consider, well, can we call this poetry? And yes, we can, because we're going to see that Goethe writes in verse. So as a result of all of these different elements contained within Faust, we see that Goethe is able to transcend genre. Moving on then to our literary analysis techniques, the first thing we're going to want to understand is that we are going to be dealing heavily with dialogue. And I'm sure all of you already know what dialogue is, but just a recap, right? Dialogue is any written conversation that exists between two or more people. And we see that dialogue can occur in fiction and in nonfiction. And we're going to see central dialogue here being played out between many of the main characters, including, for example, Faust and Mephisto, the demon who he's going to sell his soul to. And we're going to look at this dialogue and understand that something about 
the way they are speaking and what they are saying is going to not only bring these characters to life, but is also going to give us insight into that character. So, for example, looking at this central demon figure, Mephisto, how does he say what he says? Can I trust what he's saying, or is there a sense of his duplicitous nature in the way that he speaks? Also turning to Faust and my understanding that Goethe is going to treat him as a romantic hero. So looking at how he says what he says, what sort of tormented emotions come through in the dialogue that he uses. And then finally, just a few tips to help clarify meaning. So these then are in addition to our active reading skills that we're already familiar with. And I've gone ahead and pasted a sample picture from your textbook page 885 of Faust, and I'm going to point out these different clarification techniques and use them for you just so we can get into the uh, mode of practicing that. So the first thing you're going to want to do, as you should already be doing right with all of our text, is to read the side notes that occur. So anything that takes place on the right hand column, you'll see that you're given numbers. These numbers correlate to the number verse that it's discussing, right? So for example, the arrow is pointing to this side note for verses 71 to 72. And I understand that in these verses, he's simply saying that people need a challenge to keep them from becoming lazy and complacent. So here the textbook has gone ahead and paraphrased that for me. The next thing I wanna make sure I look at are these words to know. So looking at the bottom of that page, so I have two new vocabulary words here. So abate, meaning to lessen in intensity, and humanely, meaning to do something in a compassionate or sympathetic way, both of which are going to help me better understand the text above. The next technique that I need to be able to do is to reorder words. And this is primarily because we do in part treat Faust as poetry. That's how he chose to write his verse. And as we know with poetry, poets often have to stick to a certain meter and rhyme scheme depending on the type of poetry they're writing. And in order to do that, oftentimes we have to mess with the sequence of, a words, of the words in a sentence. So go ahead and look at the boxed line up at the top. So that's line 61. And here Mephisto says, about my bet, I have no hesitation. And so that's obviously going to sound weird to us, right? Because modern day people don't speak to one another in verse usually, right? So I'm going to then need to reorder those words to make sure I have understood clearly what he's saying. And I can reorder that and say, I have no hesitation about my bet. See, I've used only the words that have been given to me, but I place it in a sentence structure that's more natural to the way that I would speak, right? Putting my subject first, I, and then clarifying the object that I'm talking about, that bet, right? And understanding that I have no hesitation about entering into this agreement with someone. The third thing that I can do to clarify my meaning then is to paraphrase. And paraphrase is simply restating difficult sections of text in your own words. And that's going to ensure that you have understood, right? So for example, I've boxed Mephisto's lines below. I like to see the old man now and then and try to be not too uncivil. It's charming in a noble squire when he speaks humanely with the very devil. So here, it's not that I'm going to summarize, say that Mephisto says, I'm going to pretend that I am Mephisto myself and just state his words in words that I would use instead. So for example, I enjoy seeing the old man sometimes and make an effort to be polite. Yeah. Paraphrasing this idea that he likes to see the old man and that he tries to be polite to him, so not being too uncivil. It's nice when he, a servant, speaks sympathetically with me. And so here I take that second idea, right? It's a charming and a noble squire, which I've paraphrased to, it's nice when he, a servant, right? speaks sympathetically with me. And here I've relied on the words to know at the bottom to better understand exactly what they mean by humanely, here sympathetically. 
And then the very last technique I'm going to use to clarify meaning is to summarize. And the key difference between paraphrasing and summarizing is that in paraphrasing, I'm looking to include everything in the text. In summary, however, I'm just focusing on those key important things, ideas that I have to know. And so the key important ideas from Mephisto's speech, right, is that he is mocking God with the way that he speaks, right, referring to him as an old man and a noble squire. So he takes on a very sarcastic tone and he does this to assert his dominant character. That is going to be it for today's video. In tomorrow, we're going to dive into beginning to read Prologue in Heaven, and it'll follow the same format that we've done with Dante. So if you do not have your textbook, it's honestly not a big deal. Okay? I'm going to copy paste the text for you on the slide, and we'll go through and analyze them together, utilizing those clarifying techniques we just discussed. And the only thing that we're going to do before we finish up for the Easter break then is just to finish the prologue in heaven. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.